You write in 12 Rules that you skipped a grade in school and you were small for your age. Do you think that shaped your personality and your experiences of life? Well, it did to some degree. <clears throat> made it difficult for me to participate in sports. So um, I didn't really do anything that was fundamentally athletic till I was in graduate school. So um, my parents are guilty about that because they felt that it wasn't good for me, but I'm not unhappy about it. I got through school faster. I wasn't a fan of school, and the faster I got through it, the better. Um, I think it might have encouraged me to do two other things, which was I probably hung around with rougher kids that I might have otherwise, um, as a partly as a compensation, I suppose, for being smart and academically able and also small. So I probably exaggerated my uh, roughness, mm. I suppose, and it made me more verbally more capable of verbally defending myself. But other than that, I don't think it had much of an effect. I think I pretty much left all of that behind. That's very good. Also, the other thing I was really interested in was that you married your teenage sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I met her when I was eight. So we've known each other for 50 years, yeah. So this is, I think, really fascinating. So I, I, I read that and I thought that was quite moving. And then I was reading the bit about, um, you know, the, the animal kingdom and the bit free you take away from the lobster section is that, you know, what happens if you're top lobster is that you get to impregnate all the females so that's a, as being evolutionarily successful as a lobster, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're that's proclivity towards polygamy, which is one of the things that pulls on human society. Right. And yeah. you're now the pretty big lobster. Mm -hmm. And yet you are monogamous, you're faithful to your wife. You don't, you know, you don't want to go around impregnating every woman that you see, right? No, no, one woman's enough trouble. Right, so, so I think that's, very, uh, to me that was really interesting because that's a way in which we are very obviously very different from animal society and to well, me it takes... Well, we're not that different. I mean, there, there are plenty of societies where exactly that happens. Right, but so. you, you've been able to overcome that biological urge, right? And so in the sense that maybe there are other biological urges, such as men's propensity towards violence, that might also be overcome. Well, it's not self-evident that you want it to be overcome I mean, you don't know what goes along with it, you know, I mean, obviously, first of all, defining violence isn't that straightforward. How about use of force in self-defense? Does that constitute violence? I think to me that's a separate category of, of violence. I think well, self-defense... Well, but it's not that easy to distinguish right. them. Like if you're... What, what you want to do with a child who's aggressive is socialize them so that they become sophisticated in their manifestation of their aggression. You don't want to inhibit it. You certainly don't want to... Uh, socialize little boys to be more like little girls. That's, first of all, you don't know how to do it to begin with. But second of all, it's not very, uh, it's not an advisable strategy. So... Well, I found that really, really interesting, because in the book you say that actually if you feminize men, that might give them uh, more of a, you know, might have a more of an allure towards, you know, these very fascist ideologies. Oh, there's ideologies. no doubt about that. That's, that's standard psychoanalytic, that's like psychoanalysis 101. If you repress something, it comes back with a vengeance. Okay, so tell me what you mean by feminizing in that sense. Because to me, if you don't mind me saying so, um, you are a man who is uh, quite feminine. You're in touch with your feminine side. You are very well dressed. You talk a lot about your diet. You've talked about your emotions. Oh, I you, hate talking about my diet. Right, but you, you cry in public. Mm. You, um, you enjoy spending time with your kids. You know, all of these things that are mu not no, stereotypical. No, sad, isn't it? But they're not stereotypically male, and I think mm. that's very admirable. Pretty strange behavior for a patriarchal tyrant. Well, that's why I think that you're probably, in some ways, you're not a patriarchal tyrant, or that actually all of our programming, if you want to call it that in biology, is, is, is overcomable, because you are... It's a integratable. Right, but you are a man who some people would say has a lot of feminine traits like that, and I don't... Mm. St do you think that means that you are now being in the allure of authoritarian, fascistic ideologies, because you, you know, you're baking cakes? Oh, I notice the allure. And then what do you do with that? Work to live such that there's no temptation in that, which is also what I recommend to everyone else. Right. If you see any temptation in that, then you should straighten yourself up real quick. So, and that's what I've done for decades. So, so of course you have to see the allure in that. If you don't see the allure in it, you're a fool, just like if you don't see the allure in the radical leftist ideas. I mean, if they didn't have, if, if you didn't understand the allure, you couldn't understand the ideas. They're dangerously alluring. You know, it'd be lovely if there was a strong man who could solve all our problems and those who deserved it got exactly what was coming to them. It's not something that I would recommend as a wish. So, but that doesn't mean you, you know, you want to be blind to its attraction. You want to see what the dark parts of you are attracted to. 
helps you keep an eye on where things can go if they go badly sideways. So, I don't think it has anything to do though with my, with my, what would you say, more classically feminine interests. Um, not as far as I can tell. I mean, I have all sorts of classically masculine interests too, so. Right, and um, seems to be reasonably well balanced. Right, so you talk then about social. We shouldn't socialize little boys like little girls, but actually, you know, I have lots of stereotypes. I'm interested in politics, which is overwhelmingly male dominated. Um, you have lots of classically feminine interests. Why, you know, what is the problem here with people having personalities that are a mixture? That there's no problem with that at all. The problem is when it's dictated by fiat. Well, I mean, who's who's fiat? How, how, how about the education system? So, in, well, in in schools, you think, you know, that there is... That well, I outlined, I can't remember the psychologist's name at the moment, but he was quite influential in the 1980s, who recommended as a control for male violence that boys be socialized more like little girls. And I don't think that that's a particularly unpopular viewpoint. So, on the, the, the de-emphasis on competition, for example, in, in games, the increase in... in in the rise of competitive games where scores aren't kept, that sort of thing, is all a manifestation of that kind of theory as far as I'm concerned. The idea that there's something intrinsically wrong with competition, it's a very foolish idea, especially if you want to motivate relatively aggressive boys, because they're competitive. Well, competition, that's not good, someone has to lose. It's like, well, you're not going to get very far looking at the world that way, I'm afraid. You know, maybe you want to generate a plethora of games so that everybody has a shot at winning. That's a good idea, but you certainly don't want to devalue the notion of winning. If you're doing something necessary, you should reward people who are particularly good at it. It's part of the definition of it being necessary. So, and the, the you don't want to control aggression any more than you want to control sex. You want to integrate it. And, and if it's integrated, that's the integration of the shadow from the Jungian perspective and something I talk a lot about in my lectures. It's like, you need to have the capacity for danger. You need to be dangerous, but you need to learn how to not use it except when it's necessary. And that is not the same as being harmless. Harmless, that's a terrible virtue. It's like a rabbit. There's nothing virtuous about harmlessness. It just means you're ineffectual. Yeah, I think I would agree. Well, I, I think there are some people who, through their harmlessness, become iconic and they become symbols. I think the Gandhi and the principle of non-violence. He's not harmless. He just transcended his deep violence. That is a completely different thing. Okay. Without, his, without that capacity, there would have been no way he would have had the strength of character that he had. He was an integrated person, not a harmless person. Okay. That's a very, very different thing. 